Would you stand and worship with us? In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We've gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down. As your people sing, we will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that. church what a joyful morning it is to be able to declare that our God saves and he does indeed save um, it is a joy to be here to worship uh, together with one voice and to declare those truths 
Um, and that's, that's what we get to do every week at Salem. And that's why I personally love it here. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you've chosen to be here. If it's your first time here at Salem, uh, we want to say thank you for being here. There's a thousand other churches, probably just a block away that you could have gone to, but you chose to be here. Um, and I think the Lord has a, a purpose and a plan for that. And we want to invite you to connect with us. So if you would uh, pull out your phone, uh, one and only time I guess we ask you to do that in church, except to get the Bible app, uh, and text the word CONNECT to 919-322-8605. It will be our joy to just learn a little bit more about you, and, and you'll be hearing from one of our uh, pastors in, in the following week just to say, hey, thank you for choosing to worship with us here at Salem. What a, a great place it is to be. And really, uh, when we come to worship, what we're doing in worship is that we are uh, reflecting on the character of God, what, who He is and what He's done for us. That's what we do every single week as we sing, as we, we study the Bible. And this morning, um, as part of the, the series that we're doing where we're studying the character and nature of God, the doctrines of God, uh, we want to continue our worship through prayer. And we're going to do a time of prayer now that's, that's focused on the attributes of God. So just so, so you're aware of what's going to happen and you're not like confused by anything, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present an attribute of God. And I'm not going to assume that everyone knows what it means, so I'm going to give you a definition. I'm going to give you some scripture to support it because you can't trust my word all the time, but you can always trust the word of God. Um, and then I'm going to invite you to, to, in a couple different ways that you can pray. You'll enter in a time of prayer, and then I'll move to the next one. Um, and after we've looked at all the different attributes, or some, not all of them, that we have all eternity for that. Um, but when we've looked at a few of them, I'll, I'll wrap us up in a time of prayer and we'll continue to sing. And so the first attribute of God that we're going to pray over is God's holiness. See, God's holiness means that he's set apart from creation, that he's perfect in every way, and that he is without sin. In Isaiah 6, verse 3, uh, the angels in the, the throne room of God are calling to one another, and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So this morning, we want to invite you to pray and to cry out, to praise God for his holiness, that he is not like anything else in this creation, and that because of that, he's perfectly trustworthy and he's worthy of praise. We also want to invite you to pray and to ask God to make you holy as he is holy, um, as we've been commanded to do. Um, we can only do that by his spirit, so we want to cry out and ask him to do that. And so would you pray to our holy God? second attribute of God that we're going to look at is God's justice. That God is just. This means that God will always act in accordance with what is right. And he's going to do this because he himself is the standard for what is right. Because he created all things and because he is holy, he gets to declare what is good and right. And this is what it says in Deuteronomy 32.4. It says, the rock, his word is perfect. And this is talking about God. His word is perfect for all his ways are justice a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. And we live in a world of injustice, marred by sin, and yet we have a God who, who is just. And so we want to cry out to him and, and beg on behalf of his just nature that, that justice would pour out on this earth. And we want to thank him that he is a just God, that he will not forget sin, that the guilty will one day be punished. That is a, that's good news, but we also want to ask God that, that he will help us to pursue justice here on this earth until the day when he brings justice and its completion on the day of his return. So would you pray to our just God? God is that God is gracious and merciful. So while, while, while God is, is holy and just, he's also gracious and merciful, meaning that he shows his goodness toward us even though we are sinners and we don't deserve it. Even though we deserve the punishment of our sin, 
Exodus 34, 6 tells us that the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed his name, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And so we want to cry out to God and, and thank him for his grace and mercy. Because of his grace and mercy, he has sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins so that we don't have to bear the penalty of our sin. So Thank the Lord for his grace and mercy as we pray and ask him to make you gracious and merciful when it comes to the people sitting next to you and behind you, the people in your family, at work, your school, wherever it may be. So let's pray to our gracious and merciful God. present. This means that God is present at every point in space and time, that he is never not there. That's just a beautiful truth for us, that no matter how far we go or how close we think we are to God, he's still right there. Psalm 139, 7 through 10 says it better than I ever could. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And so we want to pray and we just want to praise God that he is always with us and that he will never forsake us. That no matter how wicked we may feel this morning, that he is right there waiting for us. So cry out to him and thank him for that truth. God is self-existent. What does this mean? It means that God has always existed. It means that he, he was never created, nor did he come into being. It means he doesn't need us. He is eternally self-existent and self-sufficient. He has been existing from eternity past and will forever be existent, yet in his grace he created us. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, Wherever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So cry out this morning to the everlasting God who, who has been in existence for all time and praise him that he allows us to join in on his work. fact that God is unchanging. This is a beautiful truth in light of the attributes we've already looked at, is that in his character, nature, and promises, God never changes. He will always be. He's always been, he'll always be. He, he was always going to be just and holy and gracious and merciful. Hebrews 13, 8 says it very plainly, Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forevermore, which means we can never out his grace. It means that the promise that saved us is the promise that's going to hold us fast to the end. And so we want to cry out to God and thank him and join in with generations before us, praising God for who he is and his unchanging nature. exalt your name because you alone are worthy. Lord, you are the only one who is holy. You are the only one who is perfect in justice. You're the only one who's 
perfect in grace and mercy. And Lord, we thank you that no matter how far we run, no matter how far we stray, that your grace is still sufficient for us. That you're still right there with us, that you are still the same God that you were when you sent Jesus to the cross. And so, Lord, we praise you for that. We thank you that we can join in with the generations who have gone before us declaring these same truths and to know that they hold fast today. Lord, would you help us as we continue to sing that we would declare these promises out to you, our holy God. We love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. As we uh, continue in worship this morning, we're uh, just going to sing a song declaring the truth about who we believe our God is and what we believe our God has done for us. And uh, I just can't help but think about, you know, we live in a broken and fallen and sinful world. Um, and I know none of that is new, but what seems to be crazy in today's culture is like those sinful and broken things are now like put on pedestals and celebrated and worshiped. And it's just like high time for the church to stand up for God's truth and to stand on his word. Amen. And uh, with all we have this morning, let's worship him. Let's declare this truth together. Let's stand and let's sing.
this morning. God, we are thankful for the truth of who you are. We're thankful for the truth of what you've done for us. God, we are so thankful. We ask you to be with our pastor as he comes and he opens up your word. Would you move in this place? Would you move in our hearts and lives? We believe you're here. We believe you're moving already. So would you have your will and your way in this place? It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit. There's not a better song that we could have led into today's message with. And so if you've got a Bible, you'll want to pull it out. If you've got a Bible app, you'll want to open it up because we're going to be 
in several places today, but we're going to be beginning in John chapter 6. And that's where we're going to spend a lot of our time in John chapter 6 and chapter 5. So if you have your Bible, turn over there and get ready because we're going to do some work today. We're continuing our series that we began last week, Meet Your Maker. And if you missed last week, you can go back and you can watch it online. We talked about why belief in God, the concept of God, the idea of God is still so crucial and so relevant for our lives even today. And this week, we're going to be looking at the nature of God, what our God is like, and specifically how our God is different than every other God that is claimed by human beings. And so we're going to be unpacking the Trinity this week. And so if you've got a copy of the Bible, go ahead and open up to that. But before we dive in and start talking about God, I wanted to begin this morning by talking about bears. Because why not? So earlier this summer, I was speaking at a camp at Ridgecrest Conference Center, which is out in western North Carolina, off of Interstate 40 in Black Mountain, which is just east of Asheville. It's a beautiful setting. It's there in the mountains. There are trails all over the place. And the particular week that I was there, of course, we had churches coming from all over the south and the east to join us. And that week, the bears were out. I don't know how many churches, how many individuals came up to me to show me the pictures of the bears that they had seen. But people were seeing bears everywhere. It was just that time of year. And it got me thinking as I'm walking around this camp, sometimes in groups, sometimes by myself through the woods, what I would do if I approached a bear. Now, I've seen bears in the wild before, and mostly when I do, I do my thing. They do their thing. We kind of have an understanding. We don't cross into each other's paths. But I do wonder sometimes what I would do if a bear went on the attack, if a bear came at me. And if that happens to you, here's what you do. And it really depends on the type of bear that it is. If it's a black bear, which is what we were running into that week in Western North Carolina, and what you will likely run into around here. They, are, they populate the Appalachian Mountains here in the east. If you see a bear, probably a black bear. If a black bear comes at you, don't play dead. Get as big and as loud as you can. And if that bear comes at you, you punch that bear right in the face. You don't hold back. You want to be as much trouble as you can possibly be. You see, black bears don't want to have to work for their food. They're like me. Somebody shows me a plate of crab legs and I say, that's way too much work. <laughs> Delicious, but I don't know if it's worth the effort. And that's how the black bear feels about you and me. And so if he comes, you just make yourself as much of a nuisance as you can. Don't climb a tree. They're better climbers than you are, but get big and loud. Now, on the other hand, if you're out west or you're in Canada and you come upon a brown bear, a grizzly bear, do not try to fight that bear. <laughs> it's not going to go well for you. Instead, stop moving. Get down. If the bear comes close, get in the fetal position and protect your vital organs. Play dead. And hopefully the bear will pass you by. Whatever you do, don't run. The grizzly bear has four legs. You have two. It will not end well for you. A grizzly bear can run up to 30 miles an hour and you, not so much. So that's what you need to do. A little statement that you can remember. If brown, lie down. If black, fight back. There you go. If you don't remember anything else from the message today, you've learned something important <laughs> that you could take with you. But how do you know what kind of bear you're facing? I mean, if you're facing one in North Carolina, you can pretty much bet it's a black bear. But what if you're not sure? Because the color variations, I mean, there's a lot of variation in color between these different bears. Well, a black bear does not have a hump. Right, That distinctive shoulder hump doesn't have it. The rump of a black bear is higher than its shoulder. And so if, that, if you see that, if the bear has short claws, if it has oval-shaped ears, they're shorter than brown bears. They stand only about two to three and a half feet tall. You know you're probably dealing with a black bear. If on the other hand, the bear has a shoulder hump, and on a brown bear, 
The brown bear has a shoulder hump and the rump of the brown bear is lower than the hump. So you can remember that, rump lower than hump. Long claws, rounded ears, stands about three to five feet tall if it is on all fours. If they stand on their hind legs, they get even taller and far more intimidating. Then you're probably dealing with a brown bear. And when you encounter a bear, you've got to know. You need to know what kind of bear you're dealing with it so you'll know how to respond to that bear or you will not survive. And if it matters with bears, how much more does it matter with gods? You see, people come to their beliefs in gods in all kinds of different ways. People come to their belief about God based on how they feel. They base it on the thoughts that they've collected on the few trips that they've had around the sun. They come to their beliefs based on what others have told them and said. There are other people who believe that all concepts of God are equally valid. You do you and it'll all work out in the end. But we know that's not how reality works. We know that when it comes to bears. And it's certainly true when it comes to God. What you believe about God matters. It matters in light of eternity, but it matters for your life here and now. It matters whether your God is one, exists solely as the monarch of the universe, or if you believe in many gods and many different kinds of gods, or if you believe that everything is God, or if you believe that your God exists as a trinity. These different concepts about God are mutually exclusive. They cannot all be true at the same time. And which one you believe in changes everything. And it matters profoundly. Because let me tell you, You may or may not come face to face with a bear in your life. But every single person listening to me right now will one day come face to face with God. And what you believe about him matters. We here at Salem and in the Christian tradition believe that God is a trinity. We believe that because we believe that is what the Bible teaches. It is the concept of God that has been believed by the most people throughout history. And I believe that it is the belief that has been most believed because it is the most satisfying of all. It is the most beautiful and the most compelling. And we're going to see why as we unpack this. So let me begin by pointing out that our beliefs about God are rooted in the scriptures. They come from the Bible. The Bible we believe is inspired by God. That every word and every phrase of the scripture came from God through the human authors to us. That it describes events of God working in history. It is a book that has been embraced by billions over the course of its 3,500 years. If you go all the way back to when the first books were written. We do not base our beliefs about God upon our ever-changing feelings. Or on our random thoughts. Or on our subjective experiences. Or on the opinions of others. We believe it in something that has remained. And that has not changed. And so we're going to look at what the Bible tells us about the nature of God. Now, I could share many, many verses on the Trinity. However, I'm only going to share a select few today. So that hopefully we can unpack this as simply as possible. And so the first verse I want us to look at is John 6, 27. Jesus is speaking here. And he says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. First point I want to make here today is that the Father is God. Jesus says it right here. God the Father. God the Father is a very common construction in the New Testament. We hear it again and again. And so when I say the Father is God, I don't expect much argument. Most people, even people of different religions and divergent Christian beliefs would believe in that statement. The Father is God. But let's take it one step further. Not only is the Father God, the Son is God. If you have your Bible, turn over one page or just look over to the other side of the page and look at John 5, 18. Here's what the Apostle John writes. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, to kill Jesus. 
Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The Bible says Jesus made himself equal with God. And if you are equal with God, then hello, you are God. Everything God is, Jesus is. Everything Jesus is, God is. He is equal with God. God. So the Son is God. In fact, as you go on in the Gospel of John, Jesus will say, I and the Father are one. He will go on and he will say, you go back earlier in the Gospel of John and it says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Son of God. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. So the Father is God. But the Son is God as well. But then third, Not only is the Father God and the Son God, but the Spirit is God. Turn over a few more pages to the book of Acts, chapter 5. Acts, chapter 5, relates a story that some of you may be familiar with, some of you may not. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And Ananias and Sapphira were early Christian believers. And they lived at a time when many of these early Christian believers were selling property and giving the proceeds to the church so that they could meet needs and advance the mission. Well, Ananias and Sapphira owned some property. They sold it. They brought the proceeds to the church, but they did not bring all the proceeds. They brought a percentage and they kept back some of the money for themselves. There was nothing wrong with that decision. That decision was perfectly fine. The problem was they lied about it. And they told everybody, this is all the money we made from it. When in truth, it was only a part of the money that they made. And so we read in Acts chapter 5, verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? Why are you lying, Peter says, to the Holy Spirit? Verse 4, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When you lie to the Holy Spirit, Ananias, you are lying to God because the Holy Spirit is God. And of course, we read throughout the scriptures, talk about God being present, God being with, God being in his people. And when it talks about that, it talks about the Spirit of God being present. And where the Spirit is, that's where God is because the Spirit is God. So if you're following along at home, so far we've said the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. However, it's also important to note that the Son is different from the Father. Go back to Acts chapter 5. Hope you kept a finger in there. Heading back over to Acts chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 19 through 23. Where Jesus is speaking, and here's what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, I am not going to unpack all that Jesus is saying in those verses. I'm going to make one simple observation, and it's this. That verse, those verses make no sense if the Son is not different from the Father. Let me bring the point home a little bit more. I'm going to take out the references to the Son and the Father, and I'm going to put in a name. I'm not going to put my name in because I don't want to put myself in the place of God. So instead, I'm going to put Jeff's name in because he's sitting on the front row right here. So congratulations. Welcome to the sermon, Jeff. And we'll see how it sounds with Jeff in place. If these were, in fact, the same person, how weird it would sound. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Jeff can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Jeff doing. For whatever Jeff does, that that Jeff does, 
I'm confusing myself. For whatever Jeff does, that Jeff does likewise. For Jeff loves Jeff and shows Jeff all that Jeff is doing. And greater works than these will Jeff show Jeff so that you may marvel. For as Jeff raises the dead and gives them life, so also Jeff gives life to whom he will. For Jeff judges no one but has given all judgment to Jeff. That all may honor the Jeff just as they honor the Jeff who sent him. Yeah, that was nonsense. And that's exactly what the scriptures would be if the Father was not distinct from the Son and the Son was not different from the Father. We have two distinct persons here in the text. But not only is the Father different from the Son, but also the Spirit is different from the Father and the Son. If you're in John, go ahead and turn over with me to John 14, 16. I'll let you get there. Just a few pages over. And in John 14, 16, Jesus is speaking again. And here's what he says. And I, the Son, will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. So what do we have here? We have three persons. The Son will ask the Father, different person, to send a third person. The helper, the spirit of truth. So the spirit is distinct from the father and from the son. And so at this point, it looks like we've got three different gods. The father, the son, and the spirit. We are tritheists. But no, we all know we're not tritheists because we also know what the scriptures say. And I could have picked a lot of passages here, but I went to maybe one of the most iconic in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. You could turn over there. You can follow along on the screen. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Moses is speaking here. It's written down for us. And he says in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord Is one, and you shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is only one God, there is no other. Scripture says it again and again. We know that there is but one God. We do not worship three gods, we are not tritheists. We worship one God, but within that one God, there are three distinct and different gods persons. Matthew 28, 19. I'm not going to make you turn any more after this. Matthew 28, 19. Last words that Jesus speaks before he goes to be with his father in heaven. He says to the disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son And of the Spirit. There are three persons in God. And you're going to be baptized into each and every one. You hear it repeated every Sunday. That we baptize right up there. And so there are three persons. But there is only one God. And while yes we understand that more. Once we reach the New Testament. It is their presence in the Old Testament as well. Going back to that very book we just read. Deuteronomy is of course the fifth part of a five-part book known as the Pentateuch. The first five books of the Bible is one book earlier in that book at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God is creating everything. He sets out to create humanity and he says, let us, plural, in reference to God, let us make man in our image. We are made in the image of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And no, Genesis doesn't explain that in detail, but the Bible reveals it more as we go along. We believe in one God who has one essence, one being in three distinct persons. This God cannot be divided up. He does not mix together. The fullness of God belongs to each of the three persons. The Father is 100% God. The Son is 100% God. The Spirit is 100% God. Add it all up and it equals 100% God. It's not great math, but it's really good theology. 
The fullness of God is in the Father. The fullness of God is in the Son. The fullness of God is in the Spirit. And each of them do different things as the story of the Bible unfolds. Just think about it in terms of our own salvation. Our salvation was willed. It was planned by God the Father. The Son came to earth, sacrificed his life and purchased our redemption. And the Spirit convicts us of our sin, opens us up to the beauty of the gospel and changes us. The Father willed it. The Son did it. And the Spirit applies it. Teamwork makes the dream work, doesn't it? We worship a God who is one essence, one being in three distinct persons. Now, sometimes we think we understand this. Sometimes we think we have our mind around it, but we really don't fully grasp it. So when I was growing up, we were, the automobile industry was changing over to mostly what we have today, which is automatic transmissions. But back in my day, there were still a lot of manual transmissions floating around as well. And so I was around a lot of vehicles, rode in a lot of vehicles where they were driving with a stick shift. In fact, some of my best friends drove cars with a stick shift. And so I had ridden with them for a number of years. And I felt like I knew and understand how stood, how to drive a manual transmission. I had watched them do it. I had played video games that had manual transmissions. I was ready. And so the moment finally came. I was with a group of people. We had to drive a truck down the road to another location. And this truck had a stick shift, a manual transmission. And nobody knew how to drive it. Except I confidently asserted that I knew how to drive it. And I could get it there. So I got in that truck. I backed it out of the driveway. I took off down the road. I bet I made it about 20 feet before I stalled it out. And couldn't figure out how to get it going again. And then I had to confess to everyone. I don't really know how to drive a stick shift. I thought I did. I had seen it done, but I didn't really. Sometimes that's the trap we fall into when it comes to the Trinity. We think we've got it figured out. We think we understand how it works, but we're really off by a little bit. Sometimes this comes out in the analogies that we use. Uh, One that you hear used sometimes, that the Trinity is like me as a human being. So I am... A father to Elliot, Benjamin, and Gideon. I am a husband to Emily. And I am a son to my parents. And so that's like the Trinity. You know, you have a father, you have a son, and a spirit. But there's only one problem with that. I am still just one person. The same person who is a husband to Emily is also a father to Elliot, Benjamin, and Gideon. It's not a different person who is the son to my parents. It is the same person. And that's the thing about God. It is three distinct persons. Not the same person doing different things. It is three different persons. It would be like if one guy was a husband to Emily, another guy was a son to my parents, and another guy was a father to Elliot, Benjamin, and Gideon. Like I cloned myself or something. So the analogy does not work. We have three persons, not just one. Then some people will say, well, God is like water. Because water, well, it can exist as a solid. It can exist as a liquid. Or, which we've seen a lot of the last week, amen. Or it can exist as a gas. And so that's like God. He can be Father, Son, or Spirit. But there's a problem with that as well. Because one individual water molecule, H2O, can only be one of those things at a time. The same molecule cannot be both a solid, a liquid, and a gas. But our God is at all times and at every moment from eternity past to eternity future, Father, Son, and Spirit simultaneously. And so the water analogy falls short. But then some people say, well, God is like a pizza. And I instantly like this one more because I like pizza. Pizza is one of the most customizable foods. You can cut it into as many slices as you want to eat. You could take the rest, put it in your refrigerator. It gets nice and cold and you take it out later for an even more delicious snack called cold pizza. 
And so they say, well, God is like a pizza. You just you divide it into thirds and one third is the father. One third is the son and one third is the spirit. And of course, once you combine all their powers together, you get Voltron, right? <laughs> Some of y'all remember that from back in the day. But that is not how God works. He is not one third, one third, one third and combine it together and you get, you know, the massive awesome God that we worship. No, 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 no. He is, the Father is 100% God. The Son is 100%. The Spirit is 100%. He cannot be divided out. Another example that people might think of is uh, from Harry Potter. Fluffy, the three-headed dog. God is like Fluffy. He's a dog with three heads. But again, that still doesn't work because one head is not an entire dog. Fluffy still only has four legs and one tail. And everything that God is, the Father is. Everything that the Son is, that God is, the Son is. Everything that God is, the Spirit is. Analogies fall short. We can't wrap our minds completely around how we could have one God in three distinct persons. But I'm kind of grateful for that. Because if I could get my mind totally around my God, then my God would be diminished a little bit, I think. I like that he's a little bit beyond my ability to fully conceive. You know, Scripture loves analogies, but it never uses one for the three persons of God. Nor does the Bible ever use the word Trinity. And it's because it's a word that we have created to best explain the evidence that we find in the Bible, the evidence that we have laid out here this morning. Christians have believed in this concept for as long as there have been Christians. We've struggled to explain it and articulate it, but it is foundational to what we believe. But sometimes there's controversy. Back in the fourth century, there was an elder in a church in Alexandria by the name of Arius. And Arius came along and he was so concerned with the fact that we worship one God. We worship one God and he is the monarch of the universe. And so what he said is that Jesus, the son of God, was God's highest creation. That the son was created by God. His little slogan that he used for all of his followers was, there was when he was not. In other words, there was a point in time where the son did not exist because God the father had not made him yet. And this teaching earned a lot of followers and a lot of attention. It created so much controversy that eventually the Roman Empire, a guy by the name of the Roman Emperor, a guy by the name of Constantine, had to call a massive church council with bishops from all across the known world to come and discuss this. And they came to a city called Nicaea. In 325, and they met together. And at that council, the church affirmed the belief that Jesus is in fact the Son of God and that the Son of God is fully God. They confirmed the belief in the Trinity and they formulated something called the Nicene Creed, which we recited together several months ago. There was a man who was present there by the name of Athanasius. And Athanasius, after this council, became a defender of the belief in the Trinity. So much so that as he opposed those who opposed that belief, he was exiled five times. And he ended up dying in 373. After his death, a creed was written. His name was given to that creed, even though he did not write it. And it's called the Athanasian Creed. It's not much used in churches today, but I like it because it confidently expresses the church's belief in the Trinity and has been doing so for over 1,500 years. Here's what it says. We worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity, neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence. For the person of the Father is a distinct person. The person of the Son is another and that of the Holy Spirit still another. But the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one. Their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal. What quality the Father has, the Son has, and the Holy Spirit has. 
The Father is uncreated. The Son is uncreated. The Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is immeasurable. The Son is immeasurable. The Holy Spirit is immeasurable. The Father is eternal. The Son is eternal. The Holy Spirit is eternal. And yet, there are not three eternal beings. There is but one eternal being. So too, there are not three uncreated or immeasurable beings. There is but one uncreated and immeasurable being. Similarly, the Father is almighty. The Son is almighty. The Holy Spirit is almighty. Yet there are not three almighty beings. There is but one almighty being. Thus the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Yet there are not three gods. There is but one God. Thus the Father is Lord. The Son is Lord. The Holy Spirit is Lord. Yet there are not three lords. There is but one God. Lord. Make sense? <laughs> Hopefully you're beginning to put some of the pieces together. But some of you might be asking today, you might be saying, well, that has been all educational and informational, but why should I care? Why does it matter at the end of the day? Well, let me take us back to those bears that we started with. Remember those bears? The reality about bears matters when you stand face to face with one. And the reality about God matters because each and every one of us will stand face to face with God. And my hope is each and every one of us wants to pursue a relationship with God. And if you want a relationship with a person, you are interested. You want to know what they are like. And so we want to know what God is like because Jesus said in John chapter 4 that the Father is seeking people who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. And by understanding the nature of our God, we become people who worship Him in truth. God is honored when we worship Him in the reality of who He is. He's not honored when we worship a figment of our own imagination. So to be worshipers, we want to know the truth. Not speculations, not just to be led by our feelings, not to just survey the crowd and see what everybody believes about God. We want to worship what we know. What Christians have worshipped for thousands of years. What billions of people across the planet worship today. What the whole universe worships as it exists but it matters for another reason. 10 p.m. on Monday, October 17th, 2011. I was getting ready for bed. I had put on the clothes I was planning to sleep in. I'd brushed my teeth, taken out my contact lenses. I was ready to go to bed. My wife was sitting in the other room and she was great with child. She had been pregnant with our firstborn, Elliot, for almost nine months, had a few weeks to go. And from that other room, she said, I think my water just broke. And I said, are you sure? Because I just took out my contact lens and we're getting ready to go to bed. That was not what she was hoping to hear from me in that moment. And quickly I changed course, got dressed, grabbed the hospital bag, and we took off for the hospital and 17 Hours of labor later, our oldest Elliot came into the world on Tuesday, October 18th, 2011. And I became a loving father. I had become that through the process. We had, you know, from conception through pregnancy to birth. Now I was a loving father. But before all that, I had not been. I hoped to be. One day I wanted to love my children. But until that moment... It did not become a reality. And here's the truth. If not for the Trinity, then you and I do not have a God who is love. We might have a God who discovered love, who figured it out whenever he made us, but he is not love in his character and in his nature. But because of the Trinity, we can say today that we have a God of love because he has existed for all of eternity as Father and Son and Spirit, existing in loving relationship with one another. And when they decided to create, they didn't create because they were lonely or they were bored. They decided to create because out of the love and joy that they had in themselves, they wanted to share it with all of us. 
And so they created you and they created me so that we could know the love that they experience in and among themselves as Father, Son, and Spirit. That's why we can say we, had a God, we have a God of love today because he has always existed in love. And he showed that in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because of the Trinity, we can say that our God died for us. That the hymn writer was accurate when he said, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? If not for the Trinity, God outsourced your salvation. He created somebody else to go to the cross for him. But because of the Trinity, we believe that the blood of God was shed on our behalf, that God himself paid the price of our redemption. And because of that, all of your sins and all of my sins can be fully and completely forgiven because the payment was greater than anything that could ever come due because he is God and he made the payment himself. You know what the Trinity also means? It also means that no matter where you go, no matter how far you go, whether you walk through the valley of the shadow of death or you're in prison in the deepest, darkest dungeon, God is there with you because of the Trinity. Because His Spirit is with you. And not only with you, but His Spirit is in you. God is in us. We can say, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world because God is in us through his spirit and the spirit is God. Paul says in Colossians, Christ in you is the hope of glory. How can Christ be in you if the spirit is not God? I remember what one kid in one of my fifth grade Sunday school classes said one time when we talked about the fact that Jesus is in our hearts. He said, does that mean that if I go in for heart surgery and the doctor opens me up, there's going to be a little man walking around inside my left ventricle? No. Because the Spirit is God and the Spirit is in you and me. Because of the Trinity, He is present with us to change and transform us. So yeah, the Trinity matters. It matters because who we worship matters. And we want to be worshipers who worship in truth. It matters because we have a God who is love. It matters because our God died for us on the cross. It matters because of that we can be fully forgiven because he paid the price. And we can know today today that he is with us and that he is changing us. Thank God for Father, Son, and Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, today we want to thank you for the good news of the Trinity. We want to thank you that we have a Father, we have a Son, we have a Spirit. We have one God who is worthy of worship, but in three persons who have made such a tremendous difference. And my prayer today is that if there's any in this room who have not put their faith and trust in the triune God, that today they would do that that they would believe and trust in him. And today, God, we would worship you for who you are. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we get ready to close out our service, I want to invite you, if you've never trusted in Christ today, we would love to help you make that decision. We're going to have encouragers down at the front. They would love to pray with you. You can text the word next to the number on the screen and a member of our team will follow up with you. Maybe you're here today and you're carrying a burden. You've got a need and you need just somebody to lift that up and pray for you today. Our encouragers will be down front and they would love to pray with you as we get ready to close out our service. Don't waste this time. Let's use the next few moments that we have together to go to him, to pray, to sing, and to worship the God who is one being, one essence, in three distinct and marvelous persons. Let's stand together and let's respond. Darkness, child.
rise to high and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. Sing how great, how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And He's great today, and it's been a joy to worship and lift up his praises with you in truth together today. A couple things as we depart. First of all, tonight, if you are a member of Salem Baptist Church, we would invite you to join for our quarterly church conference where we discuss all the business of the church. And so if you're available, we would love to have you join us right back here in this same room at six o'clock tonight for church conference. And we also hope to see you back for the next part of our series, Meet Your Maker. We're going to be talking about how God is God and we are not. The characteristics that make him distinctly and uniquely God. And I hope that next week we'll all walk away in awe of who he is. Until that time, you are dismissed and we'll see you members tonight.